turn with me to the book of Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4. Text I'm sure we just read all the time. <laughs> so, to say I first really began to study and look at Zechariah when I was in seminary in a class on the prophets and uh, was uh, very encouraged personally by uh, some of the sections of the night visions of Zechariah. He had a series of visions in one night and this is the fifth of those night visions. Uh, chapter's short so let's just read through it. The angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it, and seven pipes on it, uh, with seven lips, uh, each on the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and you shall bring forth the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the Lord of the hosts came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of the hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice, and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven are the eyes of the Lord which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, What are these two olive trees in the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Let us pray. Father, we pray that as we look at this vision, we would see your constant provision clearly and your care through your people, as well as the truth of the gospel that runs throughout the Old Testament and has its fulfillment in the new. In Jesus' name, amen. In June 1985, our church had its first Sunday worship service. Uh, this was the sermon text of that first service. And then in December 31st, 1995, that was our first Sunday in this building, having just purchased it. And I preached on the text again. And um, I think it's appropriate to remind ourselves of the important truths presented in this vision again. Uh, Zechariah 4 is the fifth in Zechariah's night visions, as I mentioned. It speaks of small beginnings and our dependence upon the power of God for ministry and really every aspect of our Christian lives. The message of this particular vision has always been meaningful to me because it emphasizes the fact that we are dependent upon God's power and grace for everything that we do in our Christian lives and couples that idea with a dramatic promise that the Holy Spirit's power flows unceasingly to inflame and empower His church. Uh, the vision was originally a message of encouragement to Zerubbabel who was the governor of this small group of people who had returned from the Babylonian exile. You may remember that in 586 B.C., the southern kingdom that was left uh, was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar and the uh, Babylonian Empire. 
And as, as Jeremiah had prophesied, they were in the land 70 years. And at the end of that time, uh, Persia had then taken over the Babylonian Empire, and uh, the prophecies concerning return to the land became a reality when the Persian king Cyrus decreed they could return. However, you think about the multiple millions of people that entered in the land at the time of the exodus and conquest, and now only about 50,000 people returned to the land. So here's this small little company of people, and they returned around 538 BC, 70 years from the first wave of captivity. And they soon encountered opposition from the, the surrounding peoples. Uh, they managed to build substantial houses for themselves, but the work on the temple had slowed. And in 520 BC, God sent the prophet Haggai to exhort the people to resume the work to rebuild the temple. And a short time later, two months later, Zechariah delivered his message of hope and encouragement. So that's the context of these night visions. And with this history in mind, let's consider the message of this vision. First, we see that God's grace assures constant provision. Well, we see at the beginning of the chapter that an angel who had been talking with uh, Zechariah in these visions awake, wakes him up and said, What do you see? And he said, I see, behold, a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it and seven lamps on it with seven lips in each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and one on its left. We could add the information uh, down in verse 12 that mentions two golden pipes uh, from which this oil is poured into the bowl, which then fed to the lamps. Now this is the substance of the vision, and I think it's helpful when you look at these kind of pictures to break it down and envision that picture in your mind. Uh, what does he see? He sees a lampstand. It's not a, a candle holder, but a lampstand like the one used in the tabernacle and later in the temple. There was one central stem that came up, and then outside from it were the, the uh, three branches on either side, like we see menorahs, that type of thing today. And the little lamps rested on those branches. They weren't a lamp, a metal lamp like Aladdin's lamp or something like that. They were a little clay lamp where you'd see somewhat like this with a little place where the wick would go and dip into the olive oil and then, of course, feed the flame. Well, um, the bowl would be filled with olive oil and you see it then being poured out to these lamps. Now, there are some modifications that we see in this. First, uh, there was this bowl or basin hovering above it uh, that held the oil. And we see those two golden pipes, apparently from the olive trees, putting oil into that golden bowl. Second, the seven lamps had seven pipes or spouts through each of the total of 49 pipes. Now, that's often not as clear in English translations. Uh, it is a Hebrew idiomatic phrase. Uh, seven and seven pipes. H.C. Uh, Leupold points out that it's a way of expressing a distributed idea of seven each. And um, this might seem strange to have seven pipes to each lamp, but visions in Scripture often carry unusual features. And of course, you could think of seven times seven pointing to a complete or perfect, unceasing flow of the oil. So we have the large bowl or basin at the top with 49 pipes running out of it, seven to each lamp. Each lamp receiving a continual supply of oil. The third modification, as we see in the scene, is the presence of these two olive trees. Well, there certainly weren't any olive trees in the tabernacle or the temple. But here we had two olive trees, one on each side of the lampstand. And running from their branches are these two gold pipes taking the oil to the large bowl. We're told in verse 14 that it is God's anointed ones. Uh, in the Old Testament context, 
At this time, we have Zerubbabel, who is not really a king, but he is of the line of David, and he's functioning as the ruler. And the high priest at the time, who is named Joshua, and God is working through his appointed leaders. So here's basically the picture that we have. There are two olive trees producing oil. The oil is running to the large bowl. And from the bowl, each lamp is fed a continual supply of oil. Now perhaps you're already beginning to see some of the significance of this vision. What's the significance of it to Zerubbabel, Zechariah, and the people at that time? Well, notice in uh, verses uh, 6 and following, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain. And you shall bring forth the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. He goes on, says, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, meaning the new temple. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. The vision is, it's not by human might or power, but by the Spirit of God that anything is accomplished. And God liberally supplies the power of the Holy Spirit for the accomplishment of His purposes. And what are the lampstands? I think there's a direct reference to the church. Jesus used the same figure when He called the church the light of the world in Matthew 5.14. Remember when Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that you may, they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Perhaps even more directly is Revelation 120, where the exact same symbolism is used. There are, there are seven lampstands, which are said directly to represent or be the seven churches that Jesus writes the letters to. Here's a Zechariah being an Old Testament background to Revelation. Well, the continued flow of oil that God supplies to enable the lamps to give light ties directly to the statement in verse 6 that it's not by power, nor by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Well, oil in Scripture often typifies the Holy Spirit, uh, which is also a point, I think, in this context. Therefore, the message is that nothing can be accomplished without the empowering work of the Holy Spirit. But we can rest assured because God's Spirit flows unceasingly to inflame and empower His church. There's a continual flow, a constant provision of what is necessary to keep that flame alive. It is by the Spirit of God that the church is built that people are born again, that lives are changed. These things don't occur through the power of intellect or force of will or physical strength. The church is not built through the latest marketing strategy. It's built through the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now this is especially relevant to us today in light of current trends toward church growth and marketing and those kind of things. Uh, Mark Dether states that the, the purpose of too many evangelical, evangelical churches has fallen from glorifying God to growing larger, assuming that that goal, however achieved, must glorify God. Carl Broughton in his work, The Gospel for a Neo-Pagan Culture, uh, makes a statement about this approach. He said, if the aim of the church is to grow, the way to do it is to make people feel good. And when people discover that there are other ways to feel good, they leave the church they no longer need. The relevant church is sowing the seeds of its own irrelevance and loses its identity to boot. The big question today has become how to get baby boomers back. He was writing this just a little bit back. He said, polls are taken on what baby boomers want, and churches are competing to make sure they get it. 
course, today we could add to how to attract millennials. What techniques draw them in? The answer of the emergent church movement is never present truth very strongly. Keep it open, don't preach absolutes in any way. R.C. Sproul wrote, he said, I once knew a pastor who frequently expressed his philosophy of ministry by saying, we must scratch people where they itch. We must address their felt needs. Scratching people where they itch and addressing their felt needs is a stratagem of the poor steward of the oracles of God. This was the recipe for success of the false prophets in the Old Testament. The problem with focusing on felt needs is that people often do not feel the real needs they have. For instance, people really need to know the true character of God. They may not particularly feel like they need to know that God is holy or just or infinite or eternal, but there are a few things people, a few things, if any, that human beings need to know more than that. The whole counsel of God is not always possible. This is the problem for Jeremiah in his day. The false prophets were popular while Jeremiah languished in ignominy. It's not the perfect marketing strategy that builds the kingdom of God. It is the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not the well-worded sermon that our best sales presentation of the gospel that brings people to salvation. It's the power and work of the Holy Spirit. It's simply what Jesus taught. Remember when Jesus was speaking with Nicodemus and he said, unless a person is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven, can't enter the kingdom of heaven. One of the key points of debates between Reformed theology and Arminian theology is Many in theology holds that man has a moral ability to come to Christ on his own. That in his flesh he can do that which is pleasing to God. Farm theology holds that it is God who changes hearts and brings people to salvation. Now understanding this truth gives us a liberty to preach and teach the whole counsel of God. That it, because it is the power of God that changes hearts and builds his kingdom. In the original tabernacle, men had to be filled with the Holy Spirit to do the artistry work. They had to be filled with the Holy Spirit to hang the tent curtains in it. In Acts 6, when they were choosing what would be the first deacons, men had to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to serve the church. In order to go forward in our Christian lives, in order to accomplish anything that God calls us to do, we must depend on His power, not the power of our flesh or strength of will or some intellectual gift that we have. How can we try to evangelize or build a church or live our Christian lives in our own strength? Charles Spurgeon, in preaching on this idea, decided to not come into this pulpit hoping perhaps that someone will with his own free will return to Christ. My hope lies in another quarter. I hope that my master will lay hold of some of them and say, You're mine and you shall be mine. I claim you for myself. My hope arises in the freeness of grace, not in the freedom of the will. A poor haul of fish will any gospel fisherman make if he takes none but those who are eager to leap into the net. And he said, Oh, for five minutes of the great shepherd's work. When you think about the gospel itself, we know that it is only through faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved, that we, our sins are forgiven, that we can truly come before a holy and just God. If you're not in Christ, someday you'll experience what Revelation 6 calls the wrath of the Lamb. Often we do think, you know, Jesus, gentle, sweet, mild, those kind of things. But it's very striking that in Revelation 6, at the return of the Lord, it is the wrath of the Lamb poured out. It's a warning to flee to Jesus now and throw yourself upon Him and experience the, the grace and the mercy and the sweetness of Christ. 
Well, Zechariah's vision proclaims that there is a constant supply of the power of God to equip his people for the calling and work set before them. And we are to exercise a constant dependence upon God and trust him for a continuing power, empowering of the Holy Spirit. Certainly calls us to pray through that in our lives, to have the dependence upon him. We, of course, have the other had the experience in your Christian life of starting to do something for God. Uh, perhaps, you know, you're witnessing to someone and you feel your knees knocking. There's an old joke where a door-to-door -door salesman was calling on the homes and he rings the doorbell and instantly says, no one's home, I hope, I hope, I hope. <laughs> and so sometimes people feel that way. Well, this message of this vision is God will supply the power and the strength that we need when we need it and when we ask, when we're dependent upon him in prayer. We also see that God's grace assures victory over opposition. I mentioned a moment ago that as they begin to build the temple and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, the people surrounding that area begin to fight against them and complain to the Persian Empire, of which they were a part. So they're going to be rebels again and cause all kinds of problems for you. Verses 7 and verses 7 and following says, Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and you shall bring forth a top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Well, here he's getting all this opposition, not only from the outside, but there was apathy on the inside with the people that were supposed to be the workers building it. They were tired. They believed they'd already paid their dues. And, of course, the new generation isn't much interested in it either. But the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel was that he would accomplish, God would accomplish his purposes through Zerubbabel by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so the word to him is don't be discouraged. The mountain of opposition will become a plain before you. You will lay that top stone, that capstone on the temple. Now the history of how God turned the mountain of opposition to a plain is amazing. In Ezra 5 and Ezra 6, it really tells the story more fully, but the, essentially what happened is the, uh, in the Persian government, they searched the archives and found that Cyrus had commissioned this group to go back uh, a short time earlier. And so they wrote a letter back to the peoples around them who were part of that Persian empire and told them, don't bother them at all. In fact, if you do, you're in trouble with us, who has the army. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they also said, your tax dollars are going to pay for it. <laughs> We're going to tax you and pay for the rebuilding of the temple uh, in Jerusalem. So not only did God remove the opposition, he made the opposition pay for the reconstruction of the temple. It's an amazing thing. If you'd like to read it more fully, it's the first part of Ezra 5 and 6. Do you ever become discouraged or feel fearful concerning opposition you face in your life? Particularly your Christian life? We don't know what mountains of opposition we'll face in the coming year. Uh, some people face financial difficulties, sickness, death of friends or family members. Many struggles confront us. This time last year, who would have anticipated the rise of the COVID and the virus and all those types of things? Sometimes we see God's divine intervention to remove an obstacle or problem. Sometimes we see God give us the strength to work through them and deal with them. Sometimes our call is to go through suffering or pain. 
We had the promise that God will never leave us nor forsake us and empower us to live through his glory no matter what we are called to experience in our lives. Other factors, perhaps you feel your contribution to the kingdom of God is very small and very insignificant. Verse 10, through others, whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. When we started, we started with four adults and three children. Um, we're still not a large mega church by any means, but we have a fairly substantial congregation. And people who are concerned about learning and growing and serving the Lord. Again, what is the mountain you're facing your life? What was it? It could be financial difficulties, marital problems, problems with family or children, personal struggles with sin and temptation or illness. Whatever the mountain is, God can accomplish his purposes in your life in ways beyond our imagining. One last part of the vision we see in verses 12 and through 14. He sees the two olive trees and so on and so on. And the second time I answered and said, and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? He said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. He said, these, then he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. And we can think of the two branches, the anointed ministers, prophet and king, governor in this case, ruler. The olive tree itself, we could think of, I think rightly, as God. And the branches at this time were Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel. The true supply of oil ultimately comes from the one who is the prophet, priest, and king, namely uh, Jesus. Uh, ultimately, God in this Old Testament context. Here is Father and the Son ultimately sending the Holy Spirit. So I mentioned I preached on this text when we began the church and again when we first bought this building in 1995. And We've seen God's faithfulness in our church's life for the last 35 years. Growth, ministry and outreach, radio programs and various venues around the country. And the property was paid for completely within five years. Uh, when they built the road right out in front, uh, we were paid for some scrap land property, which was just difficult to mow, $251,000. And uh, I said, thank you very much. I went to the bank and we paid down the building and paid it off in about another year and a half. <laughs> older and older, we have seen God's care for us as a church. And I know the story of many people's lives in the church of God's care for them. Sometimes going through very difficult times. Many of you know Jim and Barbara Benneke. Uh, Jim just retired as a surgeon, having done over 20,000 surgeries. And um, uh, Jim's a very solid Christian man. In fact, I had him teach with me in Ukraine uh, about a year and a half ago, teaching on grief and counseling to people experiencing deep personal loss and death. And he knows that subject very well because Jim and Barbara lost their son Andrew at age 21 from cancer. And Jim told me the story of a Christmas in 2004. In his own words, he wrote this. He said, in the summer of 2004, Andrew had finished a brutal course of chemotherapy, which was followed up by a series of imaging studies. The good news from Dr. Jaffe at MD Anderson was that he had no new bone lesions. The bad news, uh, they had metastasized to both lungs requiring surgery. He was scheduled for right uh, surgery, uh, surgery in his right lung, opening the chest to remove tumors. 
in early October, knowing that he would need the left one in December. Andrew breathes through the first procedure as well as anyone can, literally being cut in half. We scheduled the left one a week before Christmas. His surgeon was confident that we would be home by December 23rd. Well, the left one went well, but he developed an air leak, which was common after sur that surgery, but not serious. But it meant that the chest had, a chest tube had to remain until the leak sealed. We'd definitely be in the hospital on Christmas. Not having prepared for the possibility of celebrating at MD Anderson, I decided that Andrew and Barb needed the gift to open on Christmas Day. Attempting to make the best of the situation, so I went, went out. MD Anderson has a free shuttle service to several places nearby, and like Target, grocery stores, shopping plazas, and so on. And he said, on Christmas Eve, I boarded the shuttle and exited at Rice Village, one of the shopping areas, and there was a nice jewelry store we had visited before. It was owned by a very nice Palestinian couple who always ask about Andrew. I found Barb a nice pair of the earrings, which he still wears to this day. I boarded the next shuttle that arrived and headed for the next stop. There happened to be a radio shack close to this stop, and that looked promising to get a present for Andrew. They had some radio-controlled cars, which were very small and were controlled by a device that could be held in one hand. Well, the store was packed with last-minute shoppers, so I took my place in line, and when it was time to check out, the clerk was a very tall African-American gentleman with a booming voice, and he looked like the actor James Earl Jones. He asked me if I would like to take advantage of their battery offer, a month's worth of batteries at a deep discount. And I explained that we were hoping not to be in Houston that long. He asked why we were here and where we were from, and I told him our story. In the meantime, the shoppers behind me were growing impatient at how long the transaction was taking. And the clerk asked me the name of my son, and told him Andrew. What happened next, I could never been prepared for, and I will never forget it. He looked out over the crowd of shoppers and announced, we're all going to bow our heads and pray for this man's son, Andrew, who's in the hospital battling cancer. Everyone stood in silence with their heads bowed. It was a profound and true grace from God. Sutherland Line offered me a ride back to M.D. Anderson. As Barb and I reflect on this Christmas, it was probably the best of our lives. It was absolutely simple. The three of us, totally dependent upon God, focusing on the true meaning of Christmas and thanking God for the real gift salvation through his son whose birth we celebrated in a way we never had before there's the message of this vision in a very real way applied to three people's lives I remember when I first met Andrew he'd been battling all these things he was a brilliant young man presidential scholar and so forth, and he just, uh, just almost happy-go-lucky. He said, yeah, I had this titanium bone here in my leg, and this and that, titanium femur, and the, just like, la di da I'm going to the Lord. He, I think he knew that his time was short. And on his deathbed, he was inviting unsaved friends and their parents in and presenting the gospel to them. I still remember the first Christmas after Andrew's death. Jim said to me, well, heaven's a little bit sweeter for me right now. Thinking of someday seeing my son again. And of course, one day, in a final resurrection, complete and total consummation of God's redemptive purposes. Let's pray.
Father, we are grateful for your promises to us in your word. And the fact that truly it is not by might or power, any type of human ability, but by your spirit that your purposes are accomplished. We pray that in all that we do as a church that you would use that for those purposes. However you want to use these things. That we would be in some way loving in your kingdom. We pray that whatever issues anyone here may be going through in their lives that you would give them comfort grace and support for those needs. Pray for anyone who may not know Jesus as their Savior that you would open their hearts to you. Open their hearts not only to their need but also awaken them to their peril and open their eyes to see the, the grace, the mercy the sweetness of Jesus and your plan of salvation. In Jesus' name.